Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this third webinar in the series hosted by the IAS. And today's focus is on test, 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 COVID-19 and HIV testing updates. And we're thrilled to have a terrific panel for you today. My name is Dr. Lucy Sackle-Moore, and I'm the Director of HIV Programs and Advocacy with the International AIDS Society. And our aim for this whole series is to provide an opportunity for discussion on the pandemic, COVID-19, and have a deeper look at some of the issues that affect and impact people living with HIV. We're also aiming to connect and celebrate the contribution of IAS members around the world and in the global response, and also in strong leadership roles and very localized responses, both to COVID-19 and to maintaining attention to HIV within this difficult time. And that's IAS members spanning across the whole spectrum of science, policy, clinical service provision, community mobilization, and many other areas as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, before I hand over to the esteemed panelists and our moderator for today, I'd just like to run through a couple of housekeeping reminders for everyone. Please note that due to the large number of attendees, uh, everyone is muted. If you would like to share a question for one of the panelists, you'll see at the bottom of your screen something that says Q and A. Please click on that and put any questions for the panelists in that box. We have saved a good amount of time at the end of the webinar to respond to as many questions as possible. If you go into that space, Q and A, you'll also see there's a little plus symbol across. And if you see that someone else has asked your question, please just click on the plus and that will help us prioritize the most pressing issues and questions for the discussion today. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, um, and please do keep your questions focused on testing. On the IAS website, there is a portal that includes the information from the previous webinars in the series, and also other information that can also be a great source of information to respond to your questions. And you can also send follow-up questions by email to the email address, which is coronavirus, oh, I've got to make sure I get it correct. <laughs> Um, the email address is coronaquestions at iasociety.org and that uh, email address is monitored at all times and then the response to those questions will be featured on the portal, the COVID-19 uh, portal for the IAS. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome you to today's webinar and my special thanks to Professor Adiba Kamarulzaman, who is the President-elect of the International AIDS Society and she's also the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Malaya and adjunct professor, sorry, adjunct associate professor at Yale University and adjunct professor at Tulane University in the United States of America. Thanks so much for joining us today, Adiba, and I'll hand over to you to moderate the session. It seems that we might be having some challenges with the sound for Adiba. So in the meantime, while, while she's just reconnecting. Okay, I think, can you hear oh, me now? There we go, great. Thanks so much. Okay, for okay great. So uh, once again, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. I can see the um, at the bottom of the screen that we have more than 360 people who've signed on for this um, terrific, um, hopefully what will be a terrific uh, session this evening with our speakers, uh, Dr. Lara Bozhnov from WHO, Dr. Ra Rachel Bashley also from WHO, Dr. Cassandra Kelly Sirino from FIND, Dr. Jerome Kim, who um, has pre-recorded his presentation, and Dr. Benson Yeo from Singapore. Um, as we've got um, a really packed um, schedule agenda to get through this, it's evening time for me, so pardon me if I keep saying evening. Um, we'll kick off with Dr. Lara Voshnov, who will um, be presenting on WHO updates on COVID-19 testing. Um, Dr. Voshnov? Great. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak during this very important webinar series. Uh, today, we thought it would be useful to touch a little bit on the diagnostic considerations for COVID-19. 
you may normally know me as a diagnostics advisor in the HIV, hepatitis, and STI department here at the WHO, but I've recently been seconded to the health emergencies team to support in the COVID-19 response. I'll give a relatively high level overview of some of the key considerations we've been thinking about over the last few weeks, rather than focus in the limited time on too much of the epidemiology and, and what's happening in countries. So if you move to the next slide, one of the first things that we're really thinking about right now is who to test and, and what are the specific considerations, the cases when, when, when we might be considering this. Of course, we want to ensure that we slow or stop transmission we want to make sure we're identifying cases, particularly those who are sickest, who need, in particular, specific care uh, to try and get better. And then I know a number of different countries right now are starting to think about how we can lift some of the ep economic and, and population restrictions uh, that many of us are facing. But of course, um, there are a number of countries that are in different phases of the epidemic. Uh, we have about four different phases that we think about, but one thing we want to consider within there, and it's it's much more nuanced and detailed, hopefully the global surveillance document that I have listed here uh, can provide you with a little bit more of the information, um, is a way to think about the epidemic for each country, but also to consider these different phases, these different potential clusters within a country. And so multiple different epidemics, different phases could be happening at one time. And of course, although we recommend all, that all suspected cases be tested for COVID, given some of the limitations that we currently have in terms of access to testing and potentially act limited resources, uh, we have suggested some prioritization of patients who should be tested first. And effectively, those are key populations who are at highest risk of developing severe disease or death. If additional testing is possible to, to open up to those severe enough for admission, if further resources are possible, uh, patient, all people with symptoms, regardless as to severity, close contacts, and then of course, potentially all contacts. And this will be somewhat nuanced uh, and, and important to think about in each country, again, depending on your phase, depending on the setting. If we move to the next slide, of course, it's important to think about how you test. What are the right sample types? And we have quite a bit of guidance to try and support those different considerations in country as well as um, how you're able to take those samples, ship them um, in order to get testing. There are a number of different current uh, sample types, specimen types that are recommended and suggested um, for COVID testing. And it, but it's important to note when you're thinking about testing that we really want to make sure that all the sample types are validated by the supplier, the test you might use, and that it's indicated as an intended use by the supplier. This will allow countries and, and healthcare workers, laboratorians to ensure that the test result that you're providing is as accurate as possible. However, there are a number of research considerations that we're really starting to think about uh, in terms of spe specimen types. As you can imagine, a number of these are, are not very um, appealing to do for a number of patients. And so whether we can have less inv invasive sample types um, used potentially easier sample types, maybe self-collection can potentially be considered. But for a number of those, we need a fair bit more research uh, in, able, in, in order for us to better understand um, how they work, how they perform, and whether we should move forward to recommendations. Moving on to the next slide, um, we're really thinking, spending a lot of time thinking about what tests to use. There's been a lot of discussion recently uh, around what are the optimal tests in order to try and identify people who are infected, as well as to try and identify those who may or may not have been infected in the past. We currently recommend the use of nucleic acid testing or otherwise called molecular testing to identify patients with COVID. There are a number of technologies that now exist. Some of them have US FDA emergency use authorization listing. Some of them have our WHO pre-qualification emergency use listing. Um, and some, you know, have the European Union CE mark and, and other regulatory approvals. We have one set that we consider as automated platforms, and these are effectively, you put a sample in and you get a result out. There are a number of more manual open platforms that allow for more flexibility and fortunately greater access to test reagents. But we really want to think about some of the biosafety standards. We did put out some recommendation uh, a few weeks ago now on relatively tight biosafety standards, but we will say that we're looking to, to lighten those 
biosafety standards to allow for more decentralization of testing, given the importance of being able to get a rapid result, uh, clinically manage a patient if they're needed, but also start contract, contact tracing. And of course, we wanna be sure that specimen handling and transport can be considered. Moving to the next slide. Right now, uh, we currently do not recommend the use of antigen detecting rapid tests for patient care. However, we're very interested in their use and really want to look into and understand the research of their performance, as well as any potential diagnostic utility. For one, we're thinking this could be potentially useful uh, in the case of identifying patients who have COVID and thinking about how they could work well with nucleic acid tests, um, whether they might provide significantly more access to testing for patients, and how we balance that uh, with the potential performance. If you click on, uh, we also currently do not recommend the use of antibody detecting rapid deaths for patient care. But again, we're really interested to see um, how some of the research goes to show us the usefulness in disease surveillance and epidemiological research. A number of countries, partners, et cetera, have really been thinking about um, how antibody detecting tests could be used. And we have a few concerns, at least at this stage, in terms of whether they should be used for diagnosis. And if you click on, some of these include, number one, whether we've, we don't at this stage know whether antibodies actually confer immunity to another round of infection. We're still not entirely sure what the rates of seroconversion even are. And if used in diagnosis, they write, they, antibody RDTs are unable to discriminate active from past infection. There's the potential for false negatives. Patients who are early in infection may not yet have antibodies. Um, and in some settings, uh, given that a lot of our country programs um, have really been developed by TB, malaria, HIV systems, there sometimes can be an over-reliance on the test result. And so we have some concerns that perhaps clinical acumen may not play as strong of a role, um, particularly if this test requires much more nuanced interpretation. And then finally, some concerns um, still, still remain around the performance of these assays. That said, we're very much looking into these uh, and really trying to work with a number of key partners um, to, to better understand their utility. Moving on to the next slide. Um, because of the limited access to diagnostics thus far in most low and middle income countries, the WHO with some key partners have developed the Diagnostics Consortium for COVID-19. There are a number of assays that currently exist uh, that have already been placed in, in most countries or a lot of countries for HIV, by HIV and TB programs. And that includes um, those from Abbott, Cepheid, and Roche. And this diagnostic consortium is bringing together some key procurement agencies, key technical partners to number one, try and gather as much information and data on testing and development that we can. We're then working with suppliers to negotiate access to tests as well as lower the prices. Once we have a pool of tests, we're looking to develop an equitable allocation for distribution of those tests to low and middle income countries, given that right now the need is quite dramatically geographically uh, spread across the world. And then of course, thinking about the additional technologies like those I just touched on to be brought into the consortium to be, again, be able to provide access to those markets that may not always get access to testing. But that said, I think we also want to encourage that countries consider a multi-pronged testing approach. In the times of COVID, this may require consideration of both automated and manual assays and perhaps multiple versions within those in order to meet the testing demands. And going on to the final slide then, uh, one, some of the key considerations in particular that we've been thinking about now with my, my HIV hat on is with HIV and TB. Like I said, a number of the COVID diagnostic tests that do exist have already been or can be used, have already been placed by HIV and TB programs and at WHO, we do encourage collaboration and sharing of currently existing molecular platforms to support the response. However, we do feel it's essential to maintain some of the critical molecular diagnostics, in particular for early infant diagnosis, given that that population can have significantly high morbidity and mortality. 
HIV viral load for very specific, for specific populations, potentially including people living with HIV disease and those suspected of failing treatment. Infants, children, and adolescents also have high rates of drug resistance, and so we want to make sure that we're able to adequately um, treat them based on, on the effectiveness of, of their treatments. And then, of course, TB patients as well. One other key point, and this should hopefully help as we loosen some of the biosafety standards for COVID testing, is that we don't recommend moving significant numbers of equipment to centralized testing, centralized settings in response to COVID, because we, don't, we want to ensure uh, that we don't disrupt the current te testing networks. So with that, uh, I want to thank, the, thank IAS for the opportunity to present and hand, hand it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Vojnov. Um, there is a lot of questions all around the world on um, the different testing modalities for COVID-19, and I'm sure the questions will uh, keep coming through the, um, the Q&A uh, box in, uh, that's provided in Zoom. But, and so I invite you to stay online because we'll take question and answer at the end of the sessions. Um, now I will invite Dr. Rachel Bejli, who is the team lead for testing preventions and populations at the Global HIV, Hepatitis and STI program at the WHO in Geneva. Her work is supporting the global normative guidance on testing, including HIV self-testing and partner testing services, and considering how this can be implemented strategically, safely and acceptably for populations. Rachel will speak on strategies for HIV testing and initiation of treatment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Adiba. And um, good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening to um, everybody. And, and thank you very much, IAS, for this opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this webinar. Next slide. Um, as our worlds have all been uh, turned upside down by COVID um, and health systems and countries are all um, really and rightly focusing on the response to COVID, it's also incredibly important to continue other health um, systems and services. Um, and um, um, I'm particularly focusing here on, on HIV um, because if we don't continue um, supporting these, um, the unintended consequence of a response to COVID will be increased mort mortality and morbidity um, for many people across many infectious diseases. So WHO, like um, all organisations working on HIV in low and middle income countries, is really um, uh, uh, focusing on maintaining um, the supply of, of antiretroviral therapies to people living with HIV and working to increase multi-month scripting, um, ways of uh, delivering uh, um, drugs safely through pharmacies and community pickups, home delivery, keeping primary health care open for um, uh, emergencies and using digital um, platforms um, to support people um, on treatment um, to help them continue. But we also need to try and maintain testing services. We've done fantastically well, um, really, towards the first 90 um, of the UN targets, 90% of people with HIV. Um, who know their status. Um, but we still have about 8 million people who remain um, undiagnosed and, and need to be supported um, to be diagnosed and linked to treatment. Next slide. So why is it important um, to continue testing? Um, people, people who are undiagnosed with HIV need to be supported, to be tested and linked to treatment for their own HIV health. But we don't know at this, at this time um, what are the interactions, if there are interactions between um, HIV and COVID-19. Um, however, um, we do want um, uh, people who are, have HIV and who are um, uh, immunocompromised or have um, comorbidities to um, be supposed to get on treatment. So this may um, help limit some of the um, COVID-related complications. When we're delivering testing, um, the first thing is we must make sure that testing services are provided safely during these times of, of COVID and ways of um, supporting testing outside facilities um, and supporting people um, to obtain services through digital and other means um, um, should really be prioritized. 
However, we will need to continue um, offering um, testing in clinical services, um, particularly in antenatal, where, it's in, where in, in, uh, testing should be offered um, to support not only um, maternal health, but also to prevent transmission to ch children, and that's HIV and, and syphilis testing. We also need to continue supporting testing for um, people with HIV to uh, um, allow their um, partners to be tested. Um, and again, here we can think about ways um, to reduce um, uh, um, client provider contact by self-testing, and I'll come on to that into a moment. Um, key populations and, um, and in the HIV world, we, we, um, we consider key populations as people um, uh, as, as men who have sex with men, um, people who um, use and inject drugs, um, transgender populations, sex workers, and people in prisons and close settings. We really need again to prioritize HIV and the other services for these populations. We need to keep um, supporting linkage um, and referrals to ART. And really forgotten, um, I think, is continuing to supply condoms and contraception. Again, because we don't want to increase the unintended consequences of the response to COVID. Also special considerations for supply chain management. For example, if we're increasing self-testing, um, to really think about the procurement issues really at an early stage um, because disruptions will occur because transport um, is obviously compromised because of the response. Next slide. Here I'm really going to talk about, about self-testing and realizing the role of self-testing during the time of COVID. WHO has really supported um, self-testing for a number of years, um, but we think um, that um, it's a real opportunity to expand self-testing use um, during the time of COVID. Self-testing can be an acceptable alternative to maintain services while um, adhering to physical distancing. Um, but we must use self-test strategically um, and um, support testing um, in priority areas, priority, um, priority Priority, epidemiological areas and for populations at greater need. And for countries um, that already have self-testing programs, um, really an opportunity to replace facility-based testing with self-testing where possible to help decongest health facilities. And in countries that are not yet um, using self-testing, um, I think this is a real opportunity to fast track um, approval of self-testing um, and get self-testing um, in, implemented in programs. Next slide. I think, you know, here we are in uh, um, uh, the end of April, and I think, you know, we've been living, living with COVID now for and it's absolutely extraordinary how it really has um, turned our worlds on their heads. Um, yet, I am com continually amazed how countries are responding to adapt their services um, um, to try and maintain HIV services during this time. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples which were shared with me um, by, um, by Kim Green from PATH, one here from Vietnam, where they have adapted um, their service to an entirely um, uh, um, uh, um, safe HIV testing services through an online reach to people at risk, um, where they can order self-tests. Self-tests can then be delivered to their homes or um, from a, um, a pickup uh, place and then they can be supported um, to, to test um, and followed up. And all along this, this um, pathway, um, they can be linked um, directly to, um, to counsellors and providers to, sort them through, to support them through the process. Next slide. And very similarly um, from Ukraine. Um, as I said, I could have given you 50 slides on the wonderful um, examples that are coming from countries. But again, this is, this is from Ukraine, again, um, an entirely of testing and support through the process, through online um, uh, with oral testing um, uh, um, uh, supplies. Next slide. And then I want to look at the other side of the coin. How can we use um, opportunities um, that um, are, are, are arising through, through the COVID response for increasing self-testing for populations who could benefit? And I want to highlight here what's happening in South Africa. It's really astonishing. Um, 28,000 um, uh, uh, healthcare workers have been trained, community healthcare workers have been trained to support the COVID response and they're going door to door um, screening um, and, and uh, supporting testing for, um, for people um, in the communities. But they're not just thinking about COVID, they're thinking about HIV 
and tuberculosis in these settings because both HIV and, and tuberculosis um, are very prevalent in, in, in South African communities. So they're using um, these community healthcare workers to deliver COVID information, COVID support, but also um, to check in um, that people who are on treatment for, um, for HIV or TB um, can have their supplies and they're providing information about that. Other examples are um, where, where um, the COVID response team is also providing um, 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 medications to, to patients. Um, and I would also argue that it's also potentially a way that you could also deliver self-test kits. Because wherever we are in, in, uh, in high HIV burden settings, men um, um, with HIV represent um, a large proportion of the undiagnosed. And now that many are um, at home, this may be a good way um, to support um, testing for, for populations that, don't, um, that, that haven't tested. COVID-19 has and will continue to change many aspects of healthcare delivery. And I think one of the potentially um, uh, um, optimistic um, uh, outcomes of the COVID response would be that some of this learning and approaches may endure in the long term and we may have a much better community um, and, 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 uh, and people-centered approach to healthcare using um, uh, community options and self-care options. My final two slides are just, um, if you can move on, are um, our resources that we have. Um, because of the limited time, I, I, I put up the links here. Um, all our HIV testing information is available on an app and you can download it at WHO H HTS info. Um, and finally, I've provided, and I think you all will have um, access to these slides, these are all the links of all the information that we have on HIV self-testing. Thank you very much. Over to Adiba. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, just as an example of how COVID has turned the world upside down, we were actually in, here in Malaysia um, about to finalize uh, the launch of HIV self-testing, but everything has now been put on hold because um, we're all under lockdown and many of us working on the HIV self-testing in Malaysia are also HIV um, clinicians and public health people. So um, just an example of how uh, you know, health other than COVID um, is, is, getting, is not getting the same attention as it used to. Uh, including HIV. Um, hopefully it's all temporary as we get uh, a better hold of, of the whole COVID situation. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Cassandra Kelly Sirino from FIND. Dr. Kelly Sirino has been with FIND since May 2017 and is currently the Director of Emerging Threats. She has over 20 years of experience working in Canada and US public health and private sector settings. She began her career at the Canadian National Microbiology Laboratory, working on emerging infectious diseases, including bacteria, viruses, and prions. Dr. Kelly Serino. Hi everyone, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to present today. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody on the call. Uh, the two previous presenters, Rachel and Lara, have done a fabulous job of really positioning, I think, some of the challenges that we're seeing and the, the need for more information around how to use diagnostics. At FIND, we're very specifically focused on a couple of different things to support gathering that data. Right now, we are working on the rapid evaluation of over 50 diagnostics. And this is through an independent evaluation through a network of 20 collaborating laboratories. And we're focusing primarily on the availability of commercially available diagnostics and the outset. But we do anticipate bringing in evaluations of new diagnostics as they become available and they come through the development pipeline. Just to give you a very quick overview of the work, we have uh, prioritized 21 manual molecular assays. So the manual assays are the nucleic acid tests that Lara had mentioned at the beginning of her talk. 11 of those, uh, we have data already available publicly on our website. So we're, we are doing this independently and we are making the results of our evaluations publicly available as soon as we have them. And we're sharing those, of course, very closely with the WHO to inform 
and to be able to guide how the performance of these tests are going to impact which, which test countries should procure and then implement. All of the tests are not performing equally, so it's extremely important to understand that nucleic acid tests in and of themselves are not all the same, and that the evaluation and the data is obviously critical for understanding how to implement and which tests to prioritize. For the RDT or the rapid diagnostic tests, which we agree and feel very strongly can bring benefit to countries, however, we also feel very strongly that their performance needs to be established so that we understand how to safely implement these tests into any kind of testing algorithm. There are five rapid diagnostic tests from four different vendors that are currently commercially available in the market and we're, we are testing those right now. We hope to have that data available to share publicly in the next couple of weeks. And then as Lara mentioned, the antibody-based tests, whether that be a rapid, develop, rapid diagnostic tests or ELISA's, are, we're much more hesitant on, but we do feel that their evaluation of these tests is critical so that we understand the performance. There's a lot of um, preliminary data out there that shows that they do not perform very well, and if they do perform, it's in very narrow windows of time. So I think speaking to how Lara presented about the use of the tests in combination with molecular and antigen-based testing is absolutely critical, and the only way that we can inform um, good decision making on this is with the with the knowledge about the performance of the tests. So there is over 40 of those tests that we have in the pipeline to evaluate. Uh, we're just starting those evaluations now, so it will be a couple of weeks before we have any data to share. Right now, what we're seeing from an innovation side, a lot of the tests that have been developed were developed obviously very rapidly and at the very early days of the, um, the outbreak. And so what we're expecting to see is that optimization is going to be needed so that we have better access to reagents that are specific for this circulating strain of coronavirus and not necessarily going to cause overlap with previous strains. And in that pipeline, we do see, um, I'll speak only about the antigen RDT right now. I think that's the one where there's a lot more attention and a lot more innovation happening. There's over 22 developers that are coming to the market probably in the next three months with new tests that hopefully are using better reagents and more specific reagents. So we may actually see an improvement in the performance of the tests that we're currently evaluating. And I think that's everybody's goal is to be able to ensure that countries have access to well-performing tests but the other, the other flip side to that is the access side, and that's something that uh, FIND is also actively working on as we talk to the manufacturers, is to understand what is their manufacturing capacity, what is their avail availability to supply into countries that are not in the highest income bracket that have the ability to put in these very large orders that we're seeing going in and swamping the markets. And so what we're trying to establish is a range of tests that are well performing, that have manufacturability and scale, so that, as was mentioned previously, countries then have flexibility and choice in terms of which test to implement. A reliance on a single test is likely going to be a very bad decision, simply because that test supply could dry up quite quickly or unexpectedly. And so having multiple different nucleic acid kit tests that you can actually rely on, and then hopefully as we get there with antigen-based RDTs to supplement that and to bring testing out into the community so that you're not bottlenecking and you're not overwhelming limited laboratory health services in some areas. So I think I'll leave, um, I'll leave that there for now if, and then I can take any questions online as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Um, we're going to move on to <clears throat> a video presentation that was recorded earlier from Dr. Jerome Kim, who's currently with the International Vaccine Institute in South Korea. Um, for everyone who's been following the um, COVID pandemic, um, South Korea has been one of the countries uh, that has done well to contain um, the spread of the pandemic. And um, one of the reasons for it is uh, believed to be the widespread testing that Korea, South Korea um, has employed ever since um, the beginning of the pandemic. So let's listen to um, the presentation from Dr. Jerome Kim. The, the recording, I believe, um, is not as wonderful as it could 
uh, be and there may be some areas where we might lose uh, some uh, some sound in the video so we apologize uh, in advance for that ready yeah go ahead good afternoon everyone and i um and i really appreciate the opportunity given to me by the international aid society uh, to speak about uh, COVID-19 uh, and the outbreak in Korea. Um, the title being Test, Track, Isolate and Treat, the End of COVID-19, Round One uh, in South Korea. So this is the South Korean model, uh, and I summarized it on the left. I mean, the first and most important thing was preparation. Um, you know, because of the MERS outbreak, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus outbreak in 2015, the Korean government um, modify its procedures and, and really actually it, and began a series of tabletop exercises uh, on a periodic basis to prepare for the next uh, outbreak. And in fact, in December, by report, there was a tabletop exercise uh, looking at a Korean couple returning from China with an unknown uh, pneumonia. Uh, and that was uh, actually pretty prescient, I think. Um, but that preparation helped them uh, when in January, we heard the first announcement of the, um, the novel coronavirus outbreak in China. So, you know, as with any kind of government operation, command, control, and communications were critical. And the new Infectious Disease Control Act allowed um, the prime minister to have, once a, a, an emergency of a certain level, uh, the highest level, red alert, uh, was declared, then there was a clear line of control from the prime minister to the Vice Minister of Health, who was in charge of the Korea CDC, and all the way down uh, to the provinces and the districts within the provinces uh, where the actual activity had to take place. The decisions were transparent, decisive, and data-driven. The messaging was absolutely clear and consistent. And there were posters and the things that appeared in your, um, in your phone and the, you know, the things that were on the countertops of uh, public places and in the subway stations and in the buses about and what you had to do in order to protect yourself and protect others. Um, and that was very clear. At the same time, the Korean people, I think, um, and this was, was also critically important, the government actually recognized this. They were willing supporters of the policy. So when it came to social distancing, hand hygiene, wearing masks, um, or um, cough hygiene, you know, the, the people really did follow these um, voluntary restrictions. There were no closures of, of um, schools. Schools were actually closed for, for um, the winter holiday anyway. Um, malls stayed open, markets stayed open. Stayed open. All these things were fine uh, that you should not engage in. Work was never closed. So, uh, you know, a third of the Institute works from home uh, where, where I work at IBI, um, but other people come in. Uh, they can come in late, they can come in early. They just have to be at IBI during critical business hours, which are defined as just a part of the day so that, you know, if people are present for meetings, um, that they, they know what the schedule is. Um, the test, isolate, track and treat policy was, was really the centerpiece of, of what Korea did. And, um, and it, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, then in terms of the preparation for release, you know, no one has a playbook or smart book on this. Um, do you use the negative slope or deaths or cases? Do you use the R, R not? Uh, or do you use some other figure? You know, do you wait until your number of local transmissions is zero for several days in a row? I mean, how do you do this? Um, and and where, where do you uh, decide to start releasing in Korea? It would be the removal of some of the high level advisories that were put on activities at gyms, at schools, at churches, et cetera. Um, do you have enough spare hospital capacity to handle a surge in case it happens during the release? Do you have the supplies, personnel, masks, protective equipment, et cetera? Um, do you have people to do the, the test, isolate, track, and treat? Um, you know, it's going to be important as you're letting go to be able to make sure that operates are controlled. And then do you pilot it, or do you just uh, let it all go at once, or different sections at once? So this goes through the Korean alert system. Um, alert level one, two, three, and four. Alert level one, the government just recognizes that it's there. Uh, the first case in Korea brings you to yellow alert. Um, a local transmission um, 
to put you at alert level three and national transmission puts you at alert level four. Once you enter alert level four, it changes where in the government the responsibility lies. It shifts for an, for an infectious disease outbreak from the Minister of Health to the Prime Minister. Um, and you can see how all the different things and timelines relate um, to the, the alert levels that were put into place. Um, this is again the timeline of the outbreak uh, looking at the new cases and, and then again looking at um, where and when these um, the different alerts were, were established. Um, and I think you know now we've been under um, 50 cases for three and a half or four weeks. Uh, we've been under 10 cases probably for over a week. And if we look at just the local transmissions, actually we've been in the single digits uh, for six days. Now. Um, and to the point now where there's um, very little, if, if any, local transmission in the disease. You know, but testing was really important and it, it, it depended on four things. First, the availability of kits. Um, I think the second is I'm calling the use of kits. I mean, everyone is reporting now how many tests the United States has done, or Germany has done, or Spain has done, and, and that's very important. Um, ease of access to uh, testing, so to make it convenient for people. And then the final thing is the, some of the issues, one of the issues in particular that has come up with kits in Korea and, and will come up in, or has come up in other places, including China. Um, so figure one actually shows President Moon visiting Xi one of company that you know, within two weeks of the outbreak had and was ready to manufacture uh, RT-PCR kits for uh, diagnosis of COVID-19. I think one of the really critical uh, parts of this was that you know, the government was ready, these small companies were ready, um, and they had capacity to manufacture kits, and that was really having the kits, developing the kits quickly, following the WHO blueprint for kits was really critical and having the supplies available when, um, when testing was initiated. Um, figure two is actually, and I'm gonna see if the, um, we can get this to work, but this looks, so if you look at the uh, y-axis, uh, this is the number of lab tests performed of COVID-19 RT-PCR, and on the x-axis you have the total confirmed cases of COVID. So if you did one test uh, and one um, diagnosis, that would be a line that says number of tests equals number of cases. So that's one to one. Uh, what you see in the, in the graph are the lines that reflect um, two cases or two tests for every one case, 10 tests for every one case, 50 tests for every one case, um, 100 and 200. And so those are the line, the little light gray lines that go upwards. And watch uh, how Korea compares to say Great Britain, the United States, um, Sweden and Italy that now. South Korea is taking off and all of a sudden it hits the, the rate of 200 um, tests for every infection. Um, you can, what you see now is Australia and New Zealand, both of which have appeared to control the disease as well, um, above between 50 and 100 tests for every known infection COVID positive. And I think one of the interesting things about this graph, and the reason it, I like it because it makes a point, you can look at Sweden, Italy, the United States, um, and what you see there is a clustering around um, 10, 10 tests for every case diagnosed. When you look at the successful countries, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, you're looking at over 50, 50 to 100 tests per known COVID diagnosis. And it really very cleanly separates. So is additional testing necessary? Perhaps, how much testing is necessary? I think these data are, are, are curious and interesting and, and, and um, deserve kind of further uh, discussion. The final point here is figure four, the doubts cast. So Korea's had now, and that's the article here from um, the Jungang Daily, which is associated with the New York Times in Korea. Um, there've been over 200 cases of people who were initially negative. So to be released from the hospital after you're COVID positive in Korea, you have to have two separate days of negative RT-PCR testing. It's a nasal swab, a pharyngeal swab, and a deep cough. So all three of those have to be negative two days in a row. And they've been letting people go and then retesting them. And of course, they, some of them have come back positive. Um, for those of us who are used to doing RT-PCR and, and kind of understand that you are looking at a virus with a genome of 30,000 base pairs, and you're looking at primer sets that probably measure something like 100 to 200 base pairs, 
it could be fragments of DNA. Infection of the, of the test kits, which were developed within a week. Um, it could be reinfection. Uh, it could be a you know a source that is sequestered away. You know, there's data from Germany uh, that would suggest that after day 10, you can't culture the virus anyway. Uh, and in fact, that's what the Korean um, data is beginning to suggest. That what you're seeing is a not a PCR artifact. But the PCR is detecting pieces of virus. It's just not detecting whole virus. Um, and again, you know, we detect it on some days and not on others because we're presumably at near the level of detection for the test, uh, the RT-PCR test. Um, for Korea, the use of information technology was very important. And, I, and I, these are screenshots from my, um, my phone. Um, the government provided free apps. These are actually um, some apps that you can, you can download. Emergency alert texts were sent, and actually we've gotten three today, including one that notified us that there has been a new infection in our neighborhood and a person who had returned from overseas. Um, and if you click on the link, it, they've been in under quarantine, so there's nothing to worry about it. But um, on occasion in the past, we would have so-and-so returned from the United States, was um, tested positive, um, and had been seen at the following marketplace. Um, and was there from 10 o'clock in the morning until 10, 15 in the morning, picked up red peppers and left and was verified by CCTV footage. So if you were there between 10 and 10, 15 and, and you develop any symptoms or, you know, um, that are suggestive, let your healthcare provider know because you can be tested free of charge. Um, and that's the way the apps work. They help you to analyze and potentially reduce your own risk to um, seek appropriate testing and if you test positive, then the government will put you into a um, uh, under observation. Uh, what's shown in the Corona map is actually something where um, you see the little uh, orange colored circle. If you tap on that, it will break down into your district. So the map gets bigger and bigger until our district, Sode Mungu. Um, I can see where uh, all the infections occurred. And the, the green dot in indicates that it's um, four days or more. <clears throat> since the actual diagnosis was made. Um, if it's yellow, it was diagnosed yesterday or today. Um, so you can tell exactly where the people were um, at, at any time relative to where you were. Um, and it's all present on this little phone app. It's completely anonymous. You don't know who it was. It just, they just tell you there was a case here. Um, click, you know, go to your local um, district office website and you can get more information on where that person uh, was and, and who they might potentially have exposed. Um, other government measures included things like finally, you know, setting up a thing where people coming from Europe, the United States, um, had mandatory testing on arrival. Um, to now where people from the United States have 14 uh, days in quarantine, and Europe, 14 days of quarantine, self-imposed, if, if you are okay with it, um, but mandatory if, you, if they catch you violating uh, quarantine. This is a self-quarantine safety app. Um, it monitors your symptoms and location. In fact, when you come in and you have this little app, it asks you questions about your symptoms every day for 14 days and at the end of 14 days, it says, okay, you're fine. Um, if you have any problems, call the following number, but bye, and, and that's it, it goes away. Um, if you happen not to answer um, the symptom guide, or if you happen, or if your GPS signal happens to fall off the map, the government officer responsible for, for checking on you will call you and if you're not answering, then we'll come to your house and talk to you um, because they, they really want people to um, take appropriate measures um, to protect uh, themselves and others. So the out of bounds alert, the symptomatic subject alert. And this is where, you know, it's not only testing, but tracking was really important. So there was an outbreak in a um, call-in center. So an insurance company's call-in center in um, Seoul. And the Ministry of, of Health and Welfare, the KCDC, did an investigation. The index case was sitting in the upper, um, sorry, in the, in the part of the floor where all the blue and white um, symbols are. Those are the chairs of the call-in center. And the index case was one of the members in the call-in center. Um, and you can see um, 79 people sitting in that room um, got infected. A total of 94 on the same floor were infected. Um, but very few people who were not on that floor. And so presumably had been exposed in elevators or, or by contact. But this allowed the ministry then to track all these people, 
to find their contacts and to isolate them, to test them, uh, and limit the outbreak to the people who were exposed and then the people they may have exposed. So again, this system uh, prevents you know, accidental, you know, one of these people, the family of one of these people going off to a theater or going out to a bar and infecting other people. So again, it's not only testing, but having tracking systems in place uh, that were really critical. And then, I mean, you can see the, um, you know, the importance of proximity or either duration or intensity of exposure uh, in, with this test and track um, map. So practically speaking, then, you know, a lot of things have gone on. And again, they never shut the country down. Um, schools have not been operating, but, you know, this being Korea, they were tests. There were lots of, there still are tests. And they made them take it out, the tests outside uh, in 2020. Um, there were lots of people outside spraying. In fact, if you um, were found to be COVID-19 positive by RT-PCR, they'd come and spray outside your apartment building and then give you stuff to clean the inside of your apartment and give you biohazard bags food and other waste into. Um, you can see the, the testing centers, the uh, mobile, the drive-in testing centers, and then the phone booth ones, which are you know, being copied all over the world, um, and, and really are a convenience thing. They actually decrease wait times by about 50%. Um, but shown in the bottom three things are the, you know, they had a national assembly vote. 66% of people turned out. They all lined up with masks on, two, feet, uh, two meters apart, um, even if you were quarantined, you could vote in one of these special containment areas. And they use uh, gloves, masks, and hand sanitizer to handle all the things. So again, it was really a remarkable um, thing that went on in Korea. The taking exams part I thought was a bit funny because my wife and I like to watch these historical dramas. And they used to do this, uh, sit outside, separated by you know, two meters in ancient um, Korea. Uh, these, this is a picture of officials taking the exam uh, for national uh, service in Korea 200, no, 300 years ago. Um, and what's left are the backup slides, and you're welcome to look at those in detail. Thank you. Okay, um, as you can see, uh, South Korea had uh, an amazing system in place to test, um, isolate, and, and track. And um, I guess from what you just saw, it's no surprise that uh, they have been very successful in containing um, an initial outbreak uh, that was pretty large. Um, uh, and with, with that system in place, uh, they have really been one of the success stories uh, in the East. Dr. Kim, as, as you know, is not uh, online with us. So uh, we'll move on to Dr. Benson Yeo from Singapore. Um, Singapore was uh, able to contain um, COVID-19 like many countries in Southeast Asia initially, but unfortunately in recent weeks um, have had uh, uh, outbreaks uh, amongst um, the foreign workers. So Benson, if you can share um, Singapore experience with us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good day to, uh, to everyone. I'm Benson Yeo from uh, Department of STI Clinic Singapore. Thank you, IAS, for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to actually talk about impact of COVID-19 on HIV testing trends in uh, Singapore. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, right. So uh, some brief background on how we do HIV testing here. Um, HIV testing in Singapore requires names of all patients with a positive result uh, to be reported to the government. And uh, asymptomatic HIV screening is carried out uh, by many primary health care providers. And the largest numbers are done by the Department of STI uh, Control Clinic or DSC Clinic. And we are also tasked with carrying out the National STI Control Program. However, there are 10 sites in uh, Singapore which are exempted from the above rule and can, car can carry out anonymous testing. And the largest operator would be the Action for AIDS Singapore via our anonymous test sites and uh, mobile test sites, uh, test sites which are done on buses. Uh, right, next slide, please. Right, so uh, this is what happened uh, for uh, restrictions of uh, movement within uh, Singapore and uh, later you will explain how it affects uh, testing both in DSC clinic and in our anonymous test sites. 
So from the 7th of February, Singapore has been DOSCON orange. That is our second highest alert level in our disease outbreak response system condition. Uh, this is where companies start their business continuity plan with team segregation implemented across uh, institutions. We also started our travel restrictions, temperature screening and deferring of large scale events. Finally, from uh, 7th of April, when our second wave of COVID-19 hits us and we had an outbreak, uh, especially within our uh, foreign workers dormitory, Singapore implemented a circuit breaker measures. Uh, this is when only essential services are allowed to be open, all other services are closed. So only healthcare, food services and supermarkets uh, can be open mainly. Everybody must wear masks when they're outside of their home and uh, social distancing of one meter apart is mandatory otherwise we'll be fine. And everybody is encouraged to stay home except when we run essential errands and or uh, exercise actually. Right, uh, so next slide please. So this is what happened at our anonymous uh, test sites, uh, the number of HIV tests. Um, from January when we are having news of the novel coronavirus uh, outbreak in uh, China, it has uh, already started uh, dropping the number of uh, tests done at ATS from uh, 570 in the same month uh, the previous year to 422. And once there was a DOSCON orange uh, announced in uh, February, there was a sub drop of 75% 70 uh, tests done. Uh, that was when most of our uh, locals here were uh, slightly uh, alarmed, uh, or actually very alarmed by the uh, DOSCON orange announcement. And then in March, uh, where there seems to be some respite with uh, initial decline in COVID numbers, uh, COVID-19 uh, infection rates in Singapore, people started coming back to uh, ATS for testing and they only had about a 48% decline in the number of tests in March from 444 the previous year to 283 in March this year. Finally, in uh, April uh, or this month, where we had a very large, high numbers of uh, COVID-19 in a foreign worker dormitory. And with circuit, bre circuit breaker measures implemented, uh, re resulting in reduced uh, capacity limit on the number of staff numbers and pre-registration required, including collection of numbers. Um, so they are no longer that anonymous, uh, resulted in a very uh, large decrease in the number of people coming forward to our ATS sites to test. So from the same month in 2019, where we have 428 uh, tests done for HIV, uh, for this month, we only had 127 uh, so far, or a 70% uh, decrease. So uh, next slide, please. Right, so at where I work, the Department of SDI, in January, just because people are coming uh, out less to, to test, so there was a 21% uh, decrease. And in February, when we started our DOSCON orange, there was a 25% decrease in number of HIV tests compared to the same month last year. And then uh, finally, when we reached April with a start of circuit breaker, uh, measures, we, we were actually actively deferring uh, patients coming for uh, asymptomatic screening and we just continue management of asymptomatic uh, sexually transmitted infections and at the same time testing these patients for HIV, resulting in a 45% decrease in HIV tests done in our clinic itself in the month of April in 2020 compared to uh, April in 2019. Right, uh, next slide. Thank you. So uh, moving forward, um, testing services operators like us, I think we have to remain nimble to respond to various scenarios that uh, may develop. Uh, like in Malaysia, we are actually planning to uh, have a pilot trial of uh, HIV self-testing uh, this year, which is now uh, shelved for the time being. At the same time, we need to engage authorities on the need to continue HIV screening, that this is an essential service that we have to continue providing in the event that there's a protracted lockdown uh, or in this case, a circuit breaker measures. And we will have to ensure there's robust infection control measures by, this, uh, by us, the uh, testing service providers, in place for both our clients, patients and staff protection, and also to reassure the authorities that there won't be a cluster uh, happening just because we are going to carry on uh, testing services. And uh, finally, we should continue to reach out to clients uh, on the changes of uh, workflow when they come and see us for testing, as well as continue our outreach programs digitally, digitally uh, so that uh, patient uh, people are still 
reminded of the importance of uh, safe sex and the importance of HIV testing. But I think that's my uh, last slide. Thank you. So thank you very much, Benson, for sharing with us your experience in adjusting your services um, for HIV testing in the setting of the um, circuit breaker, or as it's called in Singapore, or, or lockdown in other places. Um, we have about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. Um, right now, my screen says there are 486 participants in this uh, webinar. And uh, many of you, thank you very much, have uh, posted questions to the Q&A box. Um, and our panelists have been very diligent in answering many of them. Um, but um, we now have an opportunity to um, ask your questions of the panelists. And um, please uh, let us know who you want to direct your question. Um, of course, Dr. Jerome Kim is not with us, uh, and it's unfortunate because uh, he just shared uh, a very impressive model of the um, pandemic response in South Korea, uh, specifically on their testing strategy. So I open the floor to questions. Uh, hi, Tifa and Anno. Let me uh, step in here because people have been uh, sharing questions through the, the chat. Uh, and I think just in the interest of time and the connection around the world, it's probably easier to respond to those questions and direct them to some of the different panellists. Um, okay. So maybe actually if I can ask, this one is actually directly to Rachel, the question that's come in about if the WHO has published any guidance for settings that cannot do regular viral load testing due to COVID-19 uh, and how to determine if a patient is stable at the moment and um, accessing ARBs and, and or what, what other guidance could, could there be in terms of defining a status as stable during this time? So, um, and I'll also bring in um, um, Lara here. Um, we haven't at this moment, as far as I'm aware, um, we're, we're in the process of, um, as you can imagine, um, as everyone in WHO is trying to um, adjust all our guidance to the time of COVID. Um, but um, at the moment, um, we, um, we haven't adjusted our, our viral load guidance other than doing, as, as, um, as, La as Lara says, to um, prioritise viral load for people who um, are um, symptomatic with HIV um, or, um, 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 or who have a history of, um, you know, of, um, of increased viral load so, or advanced disease. Um, so people who, I, I think it's, it's more a matter of being really pragmatic so people who are already stable and have been stable for um, a, a period of time, um, those those would be the ones who would be um, in this. You know, and it's 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 hopefully not going to be for an enormously long period of time, um, but to be supported to have um, multi-month scripting without the need for a clinic visit. I mean, this has been our our recommendation. Um, for some time, even you know before COVID um, came, that we wanted um, to make access to um, um, ART much simpler for, for, for stable patients. And there are already, I mean, a, a large percentage of, of people who are on treatment are, are stable, and really, it's to support that continuation. But at the same time, um, and as I say, this really applies across the board to um, all chronic conditions. There will be a need. For, for patients who have complications, who, um, who have symptoms, who have new symptoms to see um, clinical um, care. And um, that's why we need to keep those platforms for viral load still open um, to support um, clinical management. Don't know if, if, if Laura, wants to, um, Laura wants to add anything. 
I'm sure, yeah. I think I would agree that at this point, um, we're not suggesting to stop HIV viral load testing, as well as you know, tuberculosis testing, or in particular, also early infant diagnosis. I think there are some critical populations, particularly that do still need some viral load testing. And so ideally, those would continue to get care. Uh, but for those patients who have been on ART, um, who seem to be stable and healthy, uh, are taking their treatment, uh, perhaps, you know, as Rachel is suggesting, they're able to get a little bit more of multi-month scripting um, and not, fit, not come in and get as many touch points with the healthcare facility. Um, but I think we'd still, you know, in the absence of viral load testing for some, uh, would then, you know, suggest that we go back to some of the clinical um, signs and symptoms of potential treatment failure as well. But hopefully the systems that have been created to support both HIV and, and TB testing uh, are maintained in order to, to continue um, those critical diagnose, diagnostics for populations. Great. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Laura. Uh, a slightly different question, but still in relation to HIV testing and specifically HIV self-testing. So maybe I'll direct this uh, to Dr. Benson in Singapore, but also to, back to you, Rachel, as well. Um, the question is that if people are still having issues of stigma and have a fear of testing, how can we encourage HIV testing, including self-testing and the return kit during this time? So the, the question is, how do we encourage people to do self-testing? Yes, in, in prevailing issues around stigma and other barriers for people to want to take a test. Right. I, I would think uh, self-testing would be a good way uh, for people to uh, avoid feeling the stigma of coming to a, a, a test site that is specifically to, do, uh, self, to test uh, HIV. But the problem is HIV self-testing is not um, approved yet, at least in, in, in Singapore. And uh, which what we wanted to do as a trial uh, this year, but that would have to be uh, postponed uh, for now. Uh, I think management of stigma is uh, it, it's, it's difficult and um, there are legal uh, uh, barriers uh, to that, which I think we, many of us are trying to overcome uh, in Singapore now. Just to add to that, just to yeah. add to that, um, um, you know, uh, uh, what what we've we've been working on self testing at WHA for for a number of a number of years, and and um, what we found um, is that it's extraordinarily empowering um, way to to learn your status. And um, as I say, I would urge anyone who's interested in this to look at some of the um, material, the links as I've done, including some of the videos that we have with people who self-test. Mm -hmm. To go to a clinic um, with that knowledge um, that you've tested and you have HIV um, puts you into um, a really good um, position to discuss um, with your healthcare provider. Um, you don't have to start off by being quizzed about why you want to test and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and discussing all your potential risk factors and, and et cetera. You can start by saying, I've had, I've, I've had, an, I've had a, um, a test, um, uh, it's come up positive, please can uh, you help me to get that confirmed and, and, and support me for treatment. So it's, um, it, and um, we have numerous projects um, amongst um, people from key populations in many parts of the world where HIV remains very stigmatized, um, but yet, this, um, this approach really seems to have um, um, supported um, testing where um, people haven't been felt comfortable going um, initially to facilities. So, um, and my, my plea to Singapore and to Malaysia is, this is the time. Um, people are making really rapid decisions in all the COVID um, uh, um, uh, um, um, implementations. This is a response that we could really um, uh, um, support um, self-testing in this time and um, let's lobby for fast tracking it. Thanks Rachel and actually Adiba I was going to be yes. a bit cheeky and, and come to you as well from your experience in Malaysia during this time and and any creative ideas uh, you've, you've had to respond to issues and, and encourage sorry issues of stigma and, and encourage people still to test the HIV during this time. I think one of the um, 
uh, not so much in the realm of testing, but um, in terms of uh, interruptions to routine care. I mean, I work in a very large uh, tertiary care hospital that had to um, reorganize our services to provide for um, COVID management. And one of uh, the things that we had to do was to uh, limit the number of um, people attending outpatients clinic, although we didn't close the clinics, but we had to uh, limit the um, uh, number of people coming at, at quite a short notice. So, um, and to ensure that there was no treatment interruption. So there was quite um, a, a lot of work um, involving, you know, contacting patients, making sure that um, they had their medicines delivered um, during the lockdown phase in Malaysia and, uh, and so forth and so forth. So, yeah, um, I, you know, testing, um, uh, apart from uh, stalling what was a uh, very close to um, launch uh, of the HIV self-testing. So Rachel, I take, your I take up your challenge and uh, see if we can fast track that. Um, we also had to make sure that um, routine HIV services um, were not interrupted and, and treatment was, were not interrupt was not interrupted during this period. Thanks, Adiba. And, and a question that's come in, or a comment that's rather that's come in on the YouTube channel is actually in relation to stigma and the response and the association with COVID-19 as well. And a, and a comment where a family has been uh, experienced violence based on the positive diagnosis for COVID-19 in that community. And it's unfortunate that uh, Dr. Jerome Kim couldn't be with us live because I'm sure he'd have some interesting reflections from that case he concluded with about the index patients and that. Center. Um, well, so I think, I, if I could share my, my experience there, <laughs> uh, Lucy, because in fact, um, we were just discussing this today, this evening, we had um, a healthcare worker who um, was infected with COVID in the community and subsequently, uh, you know, came to work not knowing that she was positive and, and resulted in a few other healthcare workers and patients being infected. Now, she's facing a lot of stigma, both um, in the community and within, unfortunately, within the healthcare setting uh, as well. And um, it's, it's pretty reminiscent to, you know, um, the early years and the current uh, stigma that people living with HIV experience, but it's, it is very real. Um, she uh, is almost having a PTSD kind of uh, reaction and, and, you know, we, we needing where well, well, we are providing sort of mental health support for her so it's and and you hear of this um of these incidents um more and more we are mm -hmm. thanks Adiba. thank you um now if i can shift to some of the questions that are coming in uh, more specifically around testing for covid19 um this is both a technical question. This is for Cassandra from Dr. Cassandra from Fines. A technical question, but also a broader policy type question for you. Uh, the technical question is which performance criteria will be used for the selection of best performing assays of Fines evaluations? And then the more policy type questions is what considerations would you advise people for the rollout of mass testing in low and or resource limited settings for COVID-19? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, so the performance, it's not based on performance criteria. We had a selection of different criteria that we're using to, um, we have to look at the over 400 applications that we had to our independent evaluation for the diagnostics. So on our website, and I did post it in the, in the response to the comment, um, you can actually see the criteria that we used and as well as the resulting data as it's rolling off. We looked predominantly across the claimed performance. Um, amazingly, some manufacturers actually submitted their tests to be evaluated with extremely poor performance data. So we felt that we likely weren't going to prioritize those. Um, but then much more than that, we really wanted to look at the ability of good quality manufacturing. 
We wanted to make sure that these manufacturers have footprint or existing um, supply and delivery chains into low middle income countries. And for the molecular assays in particular, we wanted to make sure that they were using platforms that were going to be readily available in low middle income countries. So we deprioritized ones that would only be most applicable, let's say to um, the US setting or you know, very high income setting. And the other factor was um, in speaking with the companies themselves, we did have uh, conversations with the ones that we had selected, down selected, was around whether or not they had uh, ability to manufacture at scale. Some of the ones that have applied are really just um, only able to produce, you know, 100 or so tests a month. Uh, it's, it's just not going to really meet any kind of demand. And so we wanted to prioritize those that would actually have the ability to meet global demand and scale. But again, going back to what I said in my presentation, which is that we recognize that global demand and supply is not going to be met by one manufacturer. This has to be, there has to be many manufacturers that are performing well and that we're able to tap into in order to make sure that all countries have access to tests. Um, from the policy side, I find doesn't do policy. Um, so I would hope that somebody, Lara maybe, or somebody from WHO would step in here. But um, for our intents and purposes, the way that we're going to share the data is openly on our website and in a performance. And we're also looking at not just the sensitivity and specificity performance of the assays, but definitely in terms of what type of sample. So when during the course of infection do these, do these tests work? That's especially important for anything to do with an antibody-based test because it's not going to work across the entire spectrum of the infection. And we're also looking at the ease of use and the ability to implement these into health systems that perhaps can't take on very complex tests or in community, you know, more decentralized testing schemes. So that's another ranking factor in terms of the way that the data will be presented. Great, thanks, Cassandra. And actually, Lara, if I could uh, pass to you, but with also a follow-up uh, policy type question. Um, it refers to, at the end of Dr. Kim's presentation, he summarized some impressive measures taken in South Korea to curtail the spread of COVID-19. And are these measures, or could you advise on some, some of those measures that could be replicable, replicable in other parts of the world, particularly in resource limited settings? Uh, I can do my best, but I think for the most part, you know, what the, the experience in Korea is certainly one that we are looking at quite a bit um, to understand, you know, the, whether it's repeatable in other countries, uh, as well as, you know, what are the best practices in doing so and, and, and how we can make some of those policy adaptations. Uh, and of course, looking at the research that's being done across, across the space um, on the diagnostics, but also on clinical management. We have quite a large clinical management team here who's really looking into this. Um, and so, you know, we're having regular conversations every day, uh, really thinking about what new is coming up, how we can really quickly address any policy decisions, um, update any policy de policy decisions and bring in new ones based on some of the experiences of, of countries across the board. Um, so it's definitely a, a dynamic si situation and one in which we're trying to, to gather as much as we can uh, in order to support countries in terms of how they adapt some of those different strategies uh, across their own settings. If, if I can chime in there a little bit about um, the, whether the measures taken, taken in South Korea is replicable, because uh, here in Malaysia, as we try to exit the lockdown, um, different groups are looking at how to do this uh, best and safely. Um, and of course, in this region, South Korea has been one of the countries you, you look to um, what was described there, I think, uh, apart from the massive testing um, rates around the country, I think the uh, other impressive um, uh, measure was the wide use of technology um, and what they did to uh, really pinpoint where um, people were was to use um, uh, you know, a, a triangulation of credit card and um, uh, telco data 
um, et cetera, et cetera, that I think um, in some countries, um, individuals might find um, a little intrusive. So it's, um, I think those uh, debates um, are ongoing in many, many countries. Um, the, the technology is definitely there. Some countries use Bluetooth um, uh, capabilities to uh, track where people, you know, the movements of, of uh, individuals. And in South Korea, it's uh, telco and credit cards and other kinds of data. And the question is, will, will individuals in, um, in advanced countries accept um, these kinds of monitoring? Thanks, Adib. It's interesting to hear about those experiences as well uh, and questions around, I guess, uh, surveillance and, and security and, and privacy and things all, all being raised links to yeah. important, you know, tracing to people's movements and things. Thank you. Um, a question here, actually, uh, probably back to you, Lara, and also potentially Adiba from your perspective from the medical school. Uh, but a couple of questions have come in in relation to any protocol or guidance related to testing and uh, approach to diagnosing COVID-19 amongst healthcare workers. Uh, is there any data in terms of monitoring how many healthcare workers have been affected, but also uh, do we know what has worked best in terms of best supporting and, and protecting the healthcare workforce uh, from the pandemic? Yeah, I think one of the uh, most striking thing about the COVID pandemic is um, the number of healthcare workers who've uh, lost their lives in, in many countries. So certainly at my own institution, this has been foremost in, um, in, our, in the design of our response because we, we, as I said, we're a large tertiary hospital um, and we're a, a hybrid hospital. We couldn't afford to be a, a solely um, COVID hospital. So we also had to manage other patients. and. Um, and, and on top of that, our hospital is right uh, smack where the epicenter of the infections in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur is at the moment. So um, very early on, we uh, instituted a um, risk assessment and healthcare worker surveillance system within the hospital. Um, learning from that very early experience of having a um, positive a uh, healthcare worker who didn't know that she was infected and then went on to infect a few other healthcare workers and patients. So we quickly put in a um, surveillance system. And to date, we've had, uh, I think, about 1,600 healthcare workers um, under surveillance, and each one of them is risk assessed. And depending on their risk, are uh, you know, told to self quarantine for. 14 or seven or three days. Um, out of all those whom we, um, whom we uh, have under surveillance, very, very few um, have been, oh, some have been infected in the community, uh, some through healthcare worker to healthcare worker um, transmission, um, but very few uh, were infected directly from patients. Um, and of those, it's from a uh, breach of PPE. So what we found was that um, those working in the COVID wards um, had zero transmission. Um, and that's, I think, thanks to uh, awareness, but also to adherence to wearing the right PPE for the right uh, procedures. Great, thanks Adiba. Uh, very interesting to hear about that example. Uh, Lara, from WHO's perspective, anything in to add to more general <laughs> considerations there? Um, just to say, you know, that we have a couple of guidance documents. They're maybe not as uh, elaborate or, or really discussing some of the operational protocols and guidance, but we definitely do consider healthcare workers um, within sort of the high risk population that, you know, should be prioritized for testing. Um, with limited resources. Of course, we want, ideally we'll, we'll test, 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 as uh, the Director General says, but um, that is certainly a key population for us um, and one in which I would encourage looking into some of the additional guidance and um, that comes out and, and that has been published already on, on sort of how to support that a little bit more. 
Great, thank you. And one final question um, for Dr. Benson in Singapore and also Rachel from WHO. Uh, questions come in in relation to health inequities and what we can see both in terms of learning about access to testing in relation to HIV and the health inequities in which we know historically HIV has thrived in terms of transmission and any learning we can apply to that in terms of targeted testing and outreach specifically for marginalized communities uh, to promote access and enable access to COVID-19 testing as well. Uh, so perhaps from the Singapore experience first and then, then in conclusion to WHO for that question. Right, so uh, in Singapore our tests are not that expensive, so it isn't really a financial uh, restriction on, on doing the test, it can be about ten dollars uh, Singapore dollars to fifty dollars Singapore dollars depending on where where the test is done but the problem we do face is um, we are not able to reach uh, some of our uh, hidden population which is our uh, usually our uh, slightly older men who may uh, visit uh, commercial sex workers so somehow our outreach programs our um, platforms that we, we uh, do our outreach on have not reached them and they are still the people that um, present late with uh, HIV uh, as opposed to um, uh, men who have sex with men uh, maybe who, who usually gets diagnosed earlier in an asymptomatic stage and we do all know that it's a much better uh, prognosis in uh, people who are diagnosed earlier. So in terms of uh, equity, um, I think that that's the, the problem we face. How, how do we reach them and how do we remove the stigma of uh, them uh, feeling that they don't need to test or they will feel embarrassed to, to come and test? Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Yes, well, this is obviously um, an extraordinarily difficult um, uh, question. Um, and it, 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 COVID, as with so many other things, um, HIV, TB, um, uh, um, non-communicable diseases, health inequities are extraordinarily stark. Um, and, um, and, and the response in low and middle income countries to COVID will, be, will face those challenges that um, we face across the board with, with health, um, with all health uh, issues. Um, I don't have an easy answer. All I can say is, um, you know, countries, low and middle income countries are um, finding solutions um, and in responding in, in incredibly innovative ways and are prioritizing this in a, in a very, very impressive um, manner. And as, as I gave the example for, from South Africa, which has put enormous amount of human resources um, into this, I think, um, but as, as we move along learning all the time, I think it is really important to think about um, how we can make sure, um, and as, as, as Laura said, um, you know, make sure that um, we can work together to get the best price for um, COVID um, testing for low and middle income countries, um, but also we can um, address the other social consequences that are going to be devastating, you know, access to food um, and all the economic hardships. Um, so it's a really collective global response um, that's needed. Um, and, you know, we have really hopeful learning from, from HIV. I mean, no one thought when we, when 3 by 5 was launched that we would now um, be where we are with HIV, with, um, you know, the vast majority of people with HIV in, uh, in Africa now being on treatment. Um, but it's going to, as I say, require us all to work together and to, to you know, really prioritise um, low and middle income countries in, in our response. Mm. Thanks, Rachel. And I think um, also in, in thinking about the, the question is also certain communities within countries as well who face extra barriers. Yeah, to no, access ab absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And, you know, I think um, people who are, are homeless, um, I mean, we, we, we've seen, you know, every single country, um, uh, um, you know, people who are um, at, at unemployed and homeless, people from with other, um, you know, facing legal barriers, people who are, are migrants. Um, so again, it's it's being flexible um, and um, and trying, you know, 
trying to have a, a, a response that supports everybody in the community um, and is uh, um, supporting those needs, you know, holistically with, with the food and the shelter um, as, as well as, as, as the COVID response. Mm. Great. Well, we're almost out of time, so I'd, I'd really like to thank the panelists very much for your time today and, and uh, thank you uh, to Adiba for moderating such a fantastic session. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to, to please do look at the IAS website for access to the, this recording from the webinar will be uploaded uh, within the next day or two and also for slides from the presentations. And please do um, send any ongoing questions by email to coronaquestions at iasociety.org. Um, yeah, and thanks once again to the speakers and, and to Dr. Jerome Kim for the pre-recording, uh, for remaining with us also for the questions. It's been a very rich discussion. Um, and we really appreciate your time. It's very busy and pressing for everyone, especially for you who are so involved in, in the responsibility. So thank you very much for being with us. We'd also like to thank the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and Merck, Sharp and Dom, our donors, uh, without whom this webinar series would not be possible. Um, and we'd also just like to everybody, let everybody know that on conclusion of the webinar in a, in a moment, uh, you'll be directed to an evaluation survey to share your feedback. It's a short survey and we really value your, your thoughts as to how we can improve these series going forward. So please do take a moment to complete that survey. Uh, thank you very much for your time and please stay tuned for the next webinar, which will be in early May on innovation as the next one in this series on COVID-19 and HIV. Thanks very much. <laughs>